So welcome to our presentation. Uh, we are the Value Group, uh, which stands for Video Games and Archaeology at Leiden University. And uh, currently we consist of four members, uh, me, myself, uh, my name is Krein, this is Aris, we have uh, one postdoc in our group, Angus, and another PhD, uh, Silla. And um, we are going to give you guys a short presentation on our topic, which is video games, toys or tools. And um, we actually started with our research group a couple of months back when Aris, like a Greek god that he is, <laughs> um, presented something very enthusiastic. So he advocated that games in archaeology can be very interesting and relevant. And of course, gamers, uh, as we are, uh, we were very interested in this idea, so we kind of uh, sat back and watched this uh, presentation. And afterwards, we got to talking, and um, yeah, actually, a week later, we started this, uh, this research uh, group. And um, well, we actually, when we started off, we immediately set up with two goals for ourselves, uh, which are, the first is um, to debunk the stereotype of gamers slash nerds and the gaming industry itself, because otherwise we and indeed uh, this field of research we're doing would not be taken seriously. And two, uh, that we wanted to show that video games are more than just toys and that there is more behind this link between uh, archaeology and video games than just a cool idea or a feeling. So um, we wanted to take this up scientifically and do actual research and prove our uh, hypotheses. Now, so the first problem we encountered was that uh, we felt that um, video games are unfortunately still seen, although of course mostly by people older uh, than we are, as toys, withholding us from doing actual work, such as writing uh, dissertations, and uh, escape from reality, and gamers are still seen as, as nerds, basically, living in separate realities, uh, who are not capable of holding any uh, conversation in real life, especially not to girls, and uh, usually are not fun at parties. And furthermore, the idea that gaming is just for boys and that girls don't play as much, or are just less interested in it, uh, is also very much alive, we think. And this image uh, is, of course, strengthened by some video games, which are um, extremely uh, exaggerating, like uh, the proportion of female body parts, and those video games uh, which propagate sex, violence, and blood, etc. Therefore, uh, we decided to start our research uh, by doing a survey amongst the student and staff members of this faculty and see if we can get an insight in, into these uh, two points which I just mentioned. And in the end we got 123 results back from the students, so uh, first and second year students, bachelor students, and uh, 46 response from the staff members of the faculty. And as you can see, um, with the three surveys, we immediately debunked those stereotypes, the, the three, the two uh, with the, the students and one with the, um, uh, the staff members. We immediately debunked those stereotypes because it turned out that there were a lot of student and staff, staff gamers as well, uh, and actually more uh, than we anticipated. And most of which indicated they are playing games irregularly and not at all at a hardcore level. And also very interesting is uh, to see that an actual majority of the gamers uh, are actually female. Although it has to be said that from the, uh, the non-gamers in this graph, um, almost three quarters were female. And furthermore, more than 60% of the response uh, thought it was an interesting subject and wanted to help us out with formulating research questions and do actual uh, field work. And I think that these figures prove that video games are for everybody, not only for the hardcore gamer geeks. And um, to support this statement and explain that video games are more uh, the meritorious, I will give the floor to my colleague here, Aris. Hello from me. Um, so now we're going to start showcasing how we can use uh, video games in the relevant academic research, or to what extent is that possible. Uh, so my topic is going to be about theoretical toys and how we can use um, video games with their spaces and the narratives that are included in. Um, so we have a lot of video games like World of Warcraft or Mass Effect 
or uh, the Elder Scrolls, uh, which consist of fully imagined worlds. Uh, they include the, their own cultures, different form of cultures, with their own characteristics, with their own cities, with their own spaces, their lore, their um, history, their tradition, depending, of course, on, on which game you play. So our example for this presentation is going to be um, World of Warcraft. Now, for those unfamiliar, World of Warcraft is the most successful uh, mass multiplayer online role-playing game. Uh, at its peak point, it had over 15 million subscribers playing the game. Um, and it's based on the Warcraft universe, which has been going on for, for decades now. Uh, and it has different tribes, and within the World of Warcraft you can play as a human, or as a dwarf, or as an orc. And you have your alliances, and you have your uh, friends, or your enemies, and you can play against the computer, or against other players. But what is more important, is that there are a lot of specific cultures within a fully imagined world. So we're going to discuss about the culture of orcs, uh, about archaeology, as a pun we said. Um, so we can see that uh, orcs uh, are a tribe which you can play. So your character can be an orc, a male or a female orc, and you can choose a class, and you can be a warrior or a priest. But generally, within um, the orcish tribe, you can see different forms um, of symbols. So orcs usually uh, use axes. They usually their armor is not um, a full plate armor. They are a nomadic tribe within this universe. So their lore and their traditions and their buildings uh, usually reflect this kind of history. They are they don't use horses. They mostly use wolves, for example. <coughs> they have nomadic banners and they are. Uh, also the leaders of the Horde, which is a major uh, function uh, in the universe. So, the main, um, they also have a capital city. So it's the capital city where all the, uh, the leaders of the Orc and the Horde <coughs> in general uh, are located and then they can uh, yeah, do their planning of, of war. So this is Orgrimmar and it's the capital city of Orcs. And as we can see, it already reflects some of uh, the characteristics of the orcs that we've seen here. So the red color is um, quite dominant. They have uh, houses which remind of usually of tents or tent-like structures, and in a whole, uh, there are buildings that that reflect their their history, how they how they came here, and how they evolved. So now within the city. We have a lot of stuff, like there is a bank where players can go and deposit their, um, their stuff or their gold. There is an auction house where players can go and sell or trade uh, the, their armor or their, uh, their goods, depending on what they collect. There are all sorts of trainers, and in this high tower you can go up and you can mount on a zeppelin which comes every few minutes and you can go to other places. So, um, Orgrimmar as, as a city, is, um, it has some clear characteristics of a capital city of any form of universe, mostly. Um, and Orgrimmar has also a large history. It was created as the capital of Orcs, and through time, and through, because World of Warcraft has been going on for like 10 years now, or even more. Um, Orgrimmar has evolved based on the history and the needs of the, of the Orcish tribe. So after several wars and uh, sieges, Orgrimmar looks kind of more warlike now. It has more fortified buildings. The main structure where the leaders are is heavily fortified. Um, the same goes for the bank which has moved, and the same goes for the, for the auction house. So overall we see a space uh, where a lot of players, and we're talking about thousands of players, of players are uh, located and interact on, and they don't only interact be uh, between them, but also with the space itself. And they, recon uh, they can reconfigure the space because if one can trace down the patterns of players moving around the city, we can see that on different servers or in different times of the game, players uh, concentrate in different places. Uh, for example, if the auction house, where it's the place you can trade the most, 
you usually see more players con uh, concentrated there. And other areas uh, of less interest, although they might be more beautiful or more appealing, um, do not see player concentration. And this is the map of Orgrimmar. So the picture that we've seen is from the value of strength, which is here. Um, but Orgrimmar is huge, so depending on where, what you want to do and which uh, kind of non-player characters you want to meet, like trainers uh, for, your, for your characters, then you move around the city. So uh, rock trainers in the past will be located at the cleft of shadows because it's an underground place and it has all sorts of symbols that reflect this rock-like uh, culture. And then you also have the value of wisdom and the value of honor, where uh, based on your class you could move there and, and train your character. And there were also other parts like the drug here, where you could see the, um, it was the tailor trainer, so if you wanted to do something relevant to tailoring or to leather working, you could go there. And there were also some houses, so you could see how the orcs live their lives within their city. And through time, uh, through history, based on, on the needs of the, of the culture, but also of the king, the map of the, of the city changed. Um, so, what is there more than just a game and players just moving around, doing absolutely nothing with their free time? Um, what we have here is a, a virtual setting with uh, a lot of cultural characteristics. Uh, and this is important because players, uh, when they play, and especially when they play long hours, and they invest uh, so much in these games, they they perceive and they engage uh, these kind of spaces. So they can actually live and, and comprehend the things that are around them. And in the end, they also reconfigure these spaces in the same way that we reconfigure our own spaces within our real cities. Because we live there, we do stuff there, and we decide where to go, which um, roads we, we choose to go to our work, and stuff like that. So. Within these kind of virtual spaces, you can simulate and you can model them in order to understand human behavior or human interaction within specific settings. Um, and then we as archaeologists, we can use some of our own methods to do this kind of stuff. Now, as Simon said before, um, it is a weird, a weird argument to just say, yeah, I'm going to reconstruct an, uh, an ancient site, and then I will just throw people in and they can walk around and see what they do. Because usually that's not what happens. Uh, people, when you put them in, in ancient settings, they just think that they are in a museum and they act like that. But they, the key difference with uh, virtual spaces and with video games is that players actually engage with the spaces. They they, they live in there and unconsciously they reconfigure these spaces. So if you want to test specific theories, if you want to test specific modelings, you can use large player bases of thousands of players, uh, which unconsciously uh, integrate within a specific space. So they're not, uh, they're only biased, based of course on our, uh, on our modern culture, but they're not biased about their setting. They don't necessarily know what the setting that they're playing in is. Um, so that's what in for the archaeology and for the, for, the, uh, for the virtual spaces of games. And then what we, <coughs> what we can do as archaeologists on video games, we can actually assist game developers to make or to influence the making of such uh, <coughs> spaces because we actually study past spaces. We comprehend how different cultures worked, or uh, at least we think we understand how different cultures worked and perceived their spaces. So we can help reconstruct or construct new and more, more engaging spaces for all sorts of reasons, from fun, being fun for the players, to actually uh, being influential and being uh, of educational proper educational purposes. So that's that for spaces and
and narratives in video games and how angus will continue yeah i'm going to talk to you a little bit about why should it be for camera because of course i want to be yeah. shot all right <laughs> of course i'm a narcissist um uh, I'm an artist, so this is me, actually, uh, right here on the screen. Wow, that's a nice bridge, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a pretty nice bridge. Uh, me in, uh, in uh, Destiny, to be precise, which is a game uh, developed by uh, Bungie, uh, which is out for multiple platforms, multiple consoles, not for PC. Um, um, so, if we look at this, is I spent quite a bit of hours crafting this character as this, not so much as some of the people that are in the game play hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours, but I think overall this character, as you see right here, made an investment of 80 hours or 90 hours. What is my most precious, uh, precious possession, maybe even uh, in real life, not really, really, but one of my most prized possessions, this little thing over here, a gun called Hawk Moon. Uh, as you can see, it's not only my most precious possession, it's also the uh, most precious possession of many other uh, Bungie uh, of uh, Destiny players out there. Now, uh, there's uh, lots of reasons what that makes that make this gun uh, something that you want to have as a player. It's quite a good uh, item in the game. Of course, you can see uh, also the comments that it's also pretty rad looking. Um, so, how do you? How? It, what is the best way to to get this particular uh, item in the game? And many other also very desirable items in the game. It is not to sacrifice many goats, it is uh, to play together. I, as an individual player, could try and, and grind in the, in the parlance of, of games, grind and grind for hours trying to get this particular gun. But <coughs> uh, it's going to be very hard for me to find it in uh, the, those areas in the game that I can actually complete by myself. The highest chances of finding uh, highly desirable items like this are in uh, so-called raids. This is the Vault of Glass raid, where, which was actually where I got this particular item. So many people, uh, six at a time, go in, try to complete this raid, and by the, by working together, by playing together, they get access to new uh, desirable material culture. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to talk about here is about materiality, but not the type of materiality that gives you a headache. And my type of materiality that I'm mm -hmm. talking here about is virtual materiality, which is way way cooler. Um, how is this useful for archaeology? You may ask. Well. Uh, maybe all of you have had uh, the epistemology course by Raymond Kopai. <laughs> then you are very well familiar with this particular guy, the Leviathan, uh, and also by the guy that uh, wrote this particular uh, book, uh, named Thomas Hobbes. Um, if not, go and read it. It's really one of the for, uh, formational texts of our current society. Anyway, what I want to highlight here is basically the central hypothesis of the Hobbesian, uh, of, of Leviathan which can you can call the Hobbesian War, that humans will wage endless war or be endlessly in, in conflict with each other over scarce resources, not ruled by an authority who has a monopoly on violence. This is actually something that is still actively believed and pushed for by archaeologists, sociologists, anthropologists, uh, a, a number of them anyway. So taking this hypothesis, what can you do with this in a game? We're going to be looking at DayZ, not the standalone game as it is out at the moment already, but I looked uh, actually at the mod uh, to another game called Arm 3, which I did in uh, some spare uh, summer months. Uh, developed by uh, um, Dean Hall, it's best typified as an MMO, so a massively multiplayer online survival game. In the game, you are playing in a post, uh, uh, sorry, not a post zombie apocalypse, but a post apocalyptic zombie world on a Russian island um, and basically when you first spawn there, when you first uh, start in, uh, in this world, you have no equipment at all. Maybe, I don't know what the current status of the game, but when I started playing I had uh, a bottle of water and maybe a can of food for, to last me one day. So you will actually uh, need to survive, so you're, you, you need to have food, you need to have access to weapons, you need to have access to things, other things to defend yourself with, medicine if you get sick. It's quite a, a hardcore kind of sandbox experience. Um, the thing is that all these things are very dangerous to acquire. There's uh, lots of zombies walking around in the cities in these games, and there's also lots of enemy players. Uh, what makes it all more interesting is that if your character dies, you are permanently dead. You have to start all over again with no equipment, so no things. Right? So this happens, of course, quite often, especially if you're new to the game, but uh, this happens especially often if you're playing by yourself. 
So what you actually see is that many people in this game, although there's no incentive for them to be doing that, there's no, no rule in the game that says you should all be playing together, this is a sandbox game, so this emergent behavior, are actually showing group or maybe even altruistic uh, behavior towards each other. They, for example, one uh, clear example of this is how they form clans, and one uh, bit of a uh, nasty way of forming a clan is if you were going to be a member of a bandit clan where you're actually going to be predating a lot of people. There's also uh, other clans that have sort of uh, made themselves into the police heroes kind of clans that are going to then literally police the bandits. There's also clans that devote themselves to medical, so if you're injured in the game, you can uh, PM them outside of the game structure and there's actually a medic that's going to come in. Another very interesting thing for me, especially because I was looking at exchange networks for my PhD thesis at the time, is that also what you see, contrary to the Bayesian uh, hypothesis, lots of trading going on in this game. So this is a, a small network where I just uh, observed a trading clan for a couple of hours in game on server, and this is all the, the basically the, so the, the nodes are individual players, and these are the networks that they started creating to, to each, with each other. So this is, of course, far from a Hobbesian universe. So instead of all predating on each other, these people are working together. Why are they working together? To get access to the type of things that will make you better survival. So material culture, guns, ammunition, food, etc. If we're talking in terms of tools or toys, I think that they're basically, what you have here is a set of theoretical tools, if you want, heuristic tools, that you can start to explore in new ways using games. So of course I think that the idea of virtual materiality is something that will basically baffle anybody who has been uh, working with this from <coughs> Baudrillard to Ingold, right? This idea that these virtual objects have a huge impact on how players structure their lives, not only their in-game lives, but also their out-game lives, um, is something very, very, that I don't think is handled very well by current theories of materiality. Of course, a very old strain of research, especially here at Leiden, with the work of uh, Huizinga, Homo Ludens, his famous book on, on games uh, and human culture, is an ethnography of play, right, that you can do. Yeah. And you can maybe even make it an ethnoarchaeology of play, because lots of these play things are literally about things. Then there's, of course, a very interesting uh, strain that you can talk about neo-tribalism. How do people in state societies start to form things like clans or moieties or guilds and things like that? What is sort of the thing that is uh, making that happen. And then I think that uh, Aris already uh, pointed this out. You can also start using it as a sort of, sort of a middle range theory a la Pinford. So you can use it to, for example, falsify standing hypotheses in archaeology or anthropology. And actually, at sufficient scales, you can turn internet ethnography into a crowdsourced agent based model. So instead of feeding your own hypothesis into an agent-based model, you can actually look at what the crowd in a game is doing, and you can, from that, start building new theories, or students who are building new models. If you want to know a little bit more about uh, what I've been talking about here, uh, this is actually based on a paper that's already out <coughs> in the Archaeological Review from Cambridge, and I'm going to pass it on. Okay. Cool. So, um, basically everything we've heard about so far has been um, more or less focused on how we can use existing video games that haven't been made with the purpose of archaeology to do sort of archaeological research in them, to sort of adapt them to our need. But on the other hand, there are also games that have been designed specifically to be used as tools, for instance, for heritage. So the one example I want to show you is a game that the four of us um, tested a couple weeks ago on a nice Saturday of gameplay. Um, which is this game called Never Alone. Now the game was developed by a very small um, tribal game developing company in Alaska together with um, an Inupiat um, First Nations group. And basically they were struggling to preserve their oral traditions and to pass this on to the younger generation. And they were thinking, how can we best do this? What is the best tool to tell this story and to preserve our heritage? So I'm actually going to show you two trailers so that you can just hear from themselves how they feel about this. Shipka Lola. 
this game is that it preserves and passes on various different types of heritage. For instance, the language is already one thing that is being forgotten by younger generations who have lost interest. And in this game, the language has a place. The whole story of a girl going out to find the origin of a blizzard is one of their main oral traditions. But linked to this, they talk about um, sustainability of their environment, um, subsistence strategies, and all kinds of other traditions. So I just want to show you another um, short video, if this will work. One of the very interesting things about the game is that besides the game, it's sort of also a documentary film, and it's many things at the same time. So during the process of this game, the community has gone to museums to look at um, objects from their ancestors and so on. So it's actually a lot of things that have gone on throughout um, the development of this game. And so ultimately what we want to conclude on is that video games are inherently toys and so they should be toys. It's not a problem that they are toys. In fact, it might be one of the big benefits that they are toys, that they're gameful, that there's play involved because that unlike watching a video, actually playing something gets you engaged and have emotions far beyond what you would have otherwise. Um, but depending on how we use these video games, they can also become powerful tools. And as we've seen from the example, this might be a game that is made as a tool or something that we can adapt to use as a tool. Um, but at the same time, there always needs to be a balance between these two aspects um, of both gameplay and um, use. And so ultimately, the purpose of our research group is to you know, look at this intersection between video games and archaeology um, in a specific academic setting. So we do have Twitter, Facebook, everything. Um, for you guys to look at. We're doing actually a playthrough of two different games um, this weekend, which I can show you a picture of, which our fantastic designer has created. Um, so we're looking, on s if you guys want to tune in on Saturday, if you have nothing else to do, or if you have bo more boring things to do, like laundry or whatever, which is what I would be doing, um, <laughs> we're probably going to look at two games, Valiant Hearts, which is set during the Great War. Um, so this is like a First World War game. And Apotheon, which of course has this sort of Greek theme going on. So we'll be uh, playing and testing these out and talking about them on Saturday. And that's it for us. Thank you.